Oh man, see that's amazing. I'm sitting here and all of a sudden the screen is just full of full of all the participants. Now my heart's really racing. So I guess um, okay. So I guess we're good to go then. Um, looks like everybody got moved over. Hopefully. Um, Good afternoon and welcome to the, uh, the, the North Carolina Art User Group Spring Symposium. Um, before we get started, I just really want to throw a, a big thank you out to um, the symposium committee, the presenters, and then everyone who's attending here today. We thank you. Thank you all for the time and efforts you put into this and the time that you're dedicating today to, to learn and listen and, and, and support other uh, GIS professionals in your communities. Thank you. Uh, one quick reminder before we, we get the get the pre presentations going. <clears throat> Excuse me. One is um, our fall conference is coming up. It's going to be a virtual conference, um, August 30th through September 2nd. Uh, registration is currently underway. You can go to our website and register there. And um, here again, if you want to present, <clears throat> please get on there and register as soon as possible. Let us know you want to present. And then uh, a big shout out to our sponsors. Uh, sponsors are, are the ones that really make the conference possible. Uh, and so just a big fat thank you to all of them. And then again, if you want to become a sponsor, uh, again, just visit our website and you can log in and, and do that. Um, so I have no other announcements. We have a great agenda today. And so what I'm gonna do is turn the, the time over to John Lay. He is the chair of the symposium committee and I'll let him uh, introduce uh, the presenters throughout the day today. So thank you all for attending. John. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Um, and thank you all the attendees uh, for showing up today. Uh, this is uh, our virtual spring symposium. We do this every uh, May and uh, we're going to just jump right in. And our first uh, speaker today is going to be Michael Colodi. Uh, and he's going to be talking and us talking to us about uh, utilizing ArcGIS field maps for mapping and managing utilities. Hey, Michael, you can take it away. Awesome, thank you very much. Let me get my screen share going. Oh, I wanna start in the middle, that's never good. Uh, so can you guys hear me all right and see my screen? Yes, we can. Excellent. So today I'm gonna to be giving a presentation about utilizing ArcGIS field maps for mapping and managing utilities. Um, we are an Esri Silver business partner and we've been using field maps probably since early fall of last year, but kind of tracking and watching all the developments as Esri shifted away, you know, started to transition from some of the older uh, mobile apps into field maps. So I'm excited to be here and look forward to talking about our experience using field maps. Um, sorry. For field data collection, my name is Mike Lodi. I'm the Northeast Regional Manager at Collier's Engineering and Design. I work very closely with our staff down in North Carolina as well. And uh, I have over 16 years experience using GIS and GPS equipment but my specific area of interest and, and focus is helping clients implement, our clients implement web and mobile GIS solutions. Uh, today, as I mentioned, we'll be discussing our experience with Esri Field Maps application. And I'll also touch base on some best practices and lessons learned with field data collection using external equipment, such as uh, external GNSS equip, uh, excuse me, receivers, laser range finders, and more. So we recently went through a, uh, a rebranding and company name change. So uh, prior to, well, in February 2020, Mazer Consulting formally changed our name to Collier's Engineering and Design. Uh, Mazer Consulting was founded in 1984 and our GIS service line started in 1999. We were providing web-based web GIS and asset management systems to our clients uh, by 2004 and have been keeping up with the evolution of web and mobile GIS ever since. Uh, Collier's Engineering and Design is basically the same great company with the same people 
providing the same services that made Mazer Consulting great. So this was a pretty big shift for us, um, the, the name change, and uh, but it's, it's been going really well. I'm really excited about it. You can see from the map on this slide, we currently have three regional offices in North Carolina. Our Charlotte and Raleigh offices opened in 2017 and Wilmington opened in 2019. Our GIS services group works closely with the service lines listed here to leverage GIS, not only for, for their clients, but we're also using field maps and all the different GIS uh, in our internal operations. So for our own field data collection as well. We're also very well versed in implementing GIS for local county and state government agencies to improve access to data and streamline operations of the, the various functions of uh, government. So the transition to field maps. Many of you are probably familiar with Esri's formal mobile applications such as ArcGIS Explorer, Collector, Navigator, Workforce, or Survey123. Um, typically in a normal environment, I like to pull, pull the crowd and see who's familiar with what so we can kind of get a baseline as we go through the presentation. Uh, it's only one of the negatives to virtual presentations, but it's still good to uh, be able to do these virtual presentations during the pandemic. While each of these different mobile applications that I mentioned worked well, they each stood alone. So this required end users to integrate different mobile apps and the end user had to sign into each different app. Multiple apps consumed, you know, your de mobile device's battery at a, a fast pace and the user experience for the mobile worker could be frustrating because they would have to sign in multiple times uh, and switch between apps throughout the day. So Field Maps integrates the functionality of each of these apps into one streamlined user-friendly app. Um, there's an overall work, or excuse me, Esri's released an overall uh, roadmap about how they're going about transitioning away from these previous apps into field maps uh, that you can find online. It's a really helpful document. Um, but basically, they've started with what used to be in Collector and uh, Explorer, kind of merge those two together, and then we'll be looking to integrate some of these other apps later. If you're so we, we kind of looked at the transition in this presentation from three different perspectives. If you're completely new to data collection, um, if you had like a traditional handheld uh, GPS unit that you would go out and collect data and post-process it and then import it into your GIS, or if you were familiar with Esri's previous apps. So if you're completely new to field data collection, the process of getting started is relatively simple and straightforward. You know, first you're gonna get your licensing, whether it's ArcGIS Online or Enterprise, um, set up your data model or use some of Esri's uh, data models that come through ArcGIS Online, prepare a web map and basically deploy it for use in field maps. Um, it's really, it's, it's pretty quick and easy to get started uh, collecting data. The transition from a, a traditional handheld GPS is welcomed by most. Um, you know, using field maps with an external antenna provides, or G GPS or GNSS antenna, provides the best of both, both worlds. You get the familiar and easy to use interface of an iOS or Android device with the benefits of high accuracy external GNSS antenna. So real quick, I wanted to pause here because I, uh, I start talking about GNSS and GPS interchangeably, but I wanted to take a minute and just talk about what the difference is between GPS and GNSS. So GPS is a global positioning system. It's owned and operated by the United States Spare, uh, Space Force. Uh, consists of 31 satellites, plus or minus a few at any given time that are continuously orbiting the Earth uh, so as, as these satellites become available, they, they pop into view for your antenna and you can collect data. Historically, that was, uh, that was pretty challenging. You had to plan what time of day it was and which day you'd get the best satellite coverage before you went out in the field. Uh, and GPS kind of limits you to only the satellites in that, um, in that satellite constellation. GNSS uh, stands for Global Navigation of Satellite System. And it's, it's pretty much the same concept, but it, 
not only uses GPS, but it uses Russia's GLONASS network, China's Baidu, the your uh, excuse me, European Union's Galileo network or India's Navic. And what this really means to us at the end of the day is that we go from maybe having 24 to 30 satellites um, to having over 100 available to us at any given time. This makes it much easier and faster to get a satellite fix that's going to give you the uh, accuracy that you want to uh, collect your data with. If you're transitioning from previous apps such as Collector, the, the change to Field Maps is, is very straightforward. Field Maps is very similar to Collector. You know, it has it has um, a better backend, which makes it function a little bit better, but it also um, gives you that straightforward data collection uh, straight, uh, interface. The web maps that you had may have previously created for collector can be used within field maps. So it's not like you have to go back and, and recreate uh, all your maps to be able to start using field maps. And Esri has really good help documentation and courses on the Esri Academy about field maps and really all the different software that you can learn from and reference during your setup. So some best practices, I mean, really brief here, but you know, you want to set up and configure your maps prior to field data collection. So we like to sit back and, you know, depending on the project or what the use is, you know, we want to figure out what assets we're collecting in the field and then also what attributes we need to collect for each of those assets. Are we going to be doing, uh, taking photographs of each asset um, and that type of uh, information. Once you have the assets and attributes determined, then you can start either using a, a, an existing data model or tweaking your data model. So maybe you wanna have drop down uh, options selected for valid values that are based off the domains in your geo database. Um, this is the type of stuff you wanna, you wanna think about ahead of time, get set up into your web map, go out and do a test uh, data collection before you wanna get out there uh, full scale. So some of the benefits of field maps you know, really streamlining field workflows is the overall goal here. Um, if you have any paper workflows or um, basically you, you get the opportunity to eliminate paper when you switch to a digital interface such as field maps. This benefits the people in the field and the people in the office because, you know, we don't have to take big, big oversized maps out in the field and try to highlight them or mark them up. As we're collecting data in the field, depending on your setup, you know, that data can be available in real time. In, uh, to people back in the office. I'd say that's really the, the number one benefit is that as you move to this digital data collection uh, through field maps, you can start to really eliminate uh, some of your paper maps and the data entry process uh, associated with those. You know, we talked earlier that field workers don't need to switch between multiple applications. This is a huge benefit um, that I think will continue to grow as Esri builds in more functionality from uh, some of these other mobile apps into field maps. Field maps can be configured to work with ArcGIS online feature services and web maps, or excuse me, hosted services and web maps or with your enterprise GIS. So you're, you're basically able to use this field maps application, whether using ArcGIS online or enterprise GIS. It works connected or offline. So connected is if your mobile device has a cellular service um, you're going to be streaming data, and as you submit or save, uh, you know, an asset you collect in the field, that's going to get fed into your uh, GIS database in real time. You also have the opportunity to go offline, so you know, mobile data plans can can be expensive, uh, or the cost can start to add up if you have a large mobile workforce. So um, Esri's really kind of improved the process of working offline in the new Field Maps app. You basically, when you're in the office, you can uh, download your map to work offline. You can choose either the aerial or the base map background. You, you have that customization or configurability available to you. Um, and then when you get back in the office, you sync and store that data back into your uh, GIS system. 
I forgot to mention earlier when I started that I, I'm having very bad allergies today. Um, so if I'm sniffling and, and uh, sound a little nasally, that's why. Sorry about that. Um, one of my favorite additions to field maps are what uh, Esri's calling map markups. So in the past, you didn't have an easy way to for someone in the field who basically notices an issue with the GIS data to get that information back into the office. You know, other than allowing those people to actually edit and change the GIS data, which may not always be the best or appropriate workflow, there, there wasn't a really an easy way to make changes to the GIS. So this new markups uh, tool allows the end user, so maybe it's a, a, you know, a DPW staff or somebody like that that isn't as familiar with GIS, but they're using the GIS now to do their inspections in the field. Um, you know, we, maybe someone like that shouldn't be editing the GIS data in real time out in the field, but these new markups allow them to basically either put a point on the map or draw a circle around a certain area and add a comment to that. And those markups can be saved right in the Field Maps app on the mobile device, or you can actually uh, send it as a screenshot, which is, is a nice option. But the one that I really like that we use now is from the mobile device, you can save those markups as a, uh, as a layer and send that back up into ArcGIS Online. So one of the workflows that we set up some of our clients with is like on a weekly basis, you know, the guys or girls out in the field um, might notice some issues with the GIS. They create their markup layer. And then once a week, they, they send that back into their GIS uh, specialist in the office who can review those uh, comments and determine what should be fed into the actual GIS database. Uh, one of the benefits of field maps is now that it, it includes some smart form capabilities. Um, this is one of the areas that I think isn't super clear from Esri on what is and isn't gonna be baked into field maps. Um, I think the current plan is that survey one, two, three will continue to exist as a standalone app. But with that said, they're also building in some smart form capabilities directly into field maps. So I think we just have to stay tuned um, with that Esri roadmap and the field maps updates that they release uh, monthly to see really, um, if you're using smart forms or survey one, two, three, what your future workflow will be as field maps continues to evolve. One of the other benefits is, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation, is this real-time location awareness. So, you know, you can now have your field workers report their location just from their smart device. So similar to what we see with our phones, you know, you see your little blue dot if you have an Apple device on, on the maps. Um, you can have that that's built in to field maps through the tracker application. And there's really a lot of benefits to that that I'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. So we help our clients, both internal and external, frame out their GIS projects by considering you know, five core components of any GIS. Uh, it's hardware, software, people, data, and then business processes or your organizational requirements. So today I'm gonna really focus on the hardware and the software. I think that's the goal of this uh, presentation. Um, so our typical equipment that we use is a our eight EOS Arrow receivers uh, paired with Apple iPads. Uh, this is our standard configuration for these type of mapping projects. But you can use Android devices, Trimble. Um, there, there's a whole host of different um, hardware manufacturers out there um, that this works with, works with. So Field Maps works with Android and iOS devices. Uh, you see here on the left uh, is uh, True Pulse Laser Rangefinder. I'll talk about some of the benefits of that as well. But that integrates directly, all of that hardware integrates directly into field maps, which is really nice. Uh, for our, the various software and mobile apps that we use are listed on the right. Uh, we'll get into further details on a few of these uh, in later slides. But for now, you know, our specific hardware and software configuration, we're using the EOS Tools mobile app, which is the main app that's used to configure, monitor, and, and uh, 
pair your, your GNSS receiver, uh, EOS receiver, that is. Uh, each of the different um, GNSS manufacturers have different apps as well. Um, but I really think extending field maps by using high accuracy GNSS receivers is really powerful, especially when you get into RTK, uh, real time uh, corrections of your data. So North Carolina Geodetic Survey establishes, established and maintains an RTK network. Uh, the North Carolina CORES network of GNSS uh, satellites. I think there is a, a small subscription fee to that, but what that allows you to do is like for a centimeter grade, uh, the EOS tool, or excuse me, EOS Hour Gold that we're showing here on the left. I mean, when we're connected to an RTK, we're seeing 0.6 centimeter accuracy horizontal. Uh, it's really amazing. And one of the things that I talked with all of our clients about and highly recommend is you can get a submeter um, GNSS antenna and collect data that, that, you know, it's maybe accurate to one to three feet. That's probably good enough for now, but maybe not if you're getting into valves or, or, or things like that that you want to navigate back to. Um, I highly recommend, you know, the cost difference between submeter and centimeter. It, it's it's five or $6,000, so it's significant, but not if you think about going out and collecting your, your data once. So if you're gonna go out, if you haven't collected your, your utility network at all yet, I highly recommend looking at the higher accuracy because the cost savings of collecting it once with centimeter grade accuracy is gonna far outweigh that equipment price difference. And then, you know, centimeter, sub-centimeter, 0.7, centimeters is probably going to be good enough for the next couple decades uh, for most of our uses. So it's close to survey grade accuracy, but you don't need to have the equipment or pay, pay uh, a professional answer bearer to get that accuracy, which may or may not be appropriate for your use. Uh, you may have noticed the four different ESRI applications listed here or more. I think we have eight. Uh, eight. Uh, the thing that we're most excited about with field maps is that we're, we're starting to narrow this list of apps that we have to have running on our devices down. So now um, ArcGIS Tracker is built into field maps, Collector. Uh, you know, we're, we're able to now have these um, apps running through one app field map. So here's an overview of the setup and configuration steps um, that are needed to get started with field maps. First, we use ESRI's data models, which can be further configured to meet your project specific requirements, or you may have your own existing data model. Uh, either way, that's fine. Field maps will work with that. So second, we create the web maps used to collect data with the field maps app. So you publish your, your web map, um, either from ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS Online, and uh, you get that web map available so that you can open it up in field maps. Next, we enable ArcGIS Tracker. It's a, it's a administrative step on the back end. First, you have to go in and just enable it either through ArcGIS Online or Enterprise, but then um, the end user is able to toggle Tracker on and off within field maps. Next, if you're using an external antenna, um, you wanna go ahead and configure that uh, to connect to iPad to your iPad and the field map software. So there's some settings within field maps um, that allow you to connect to the external antenna, do some uh, data transformations or projections on the fly because you know we're collecting data. The data in field maps and the GNSS data is in WGS84, whereas you might be using state your data might be in state plane uh, coordinate system. So you're able to do those. Uh, on the fly so that as you're looking at your data, it's overlaying correctly. We then plan our approach to the field work. It's important that all members of the team collect the same data in the same way as this maximizes the accuracy and completeness and consistency of the final data. And then the final step before collecting any actual data in the field is for us is to create a field data collection status dashboard. Uh, we like to use these dashboards to give our clients or our project team members a near real-time view of our status in the field. 
Um, this screenshot on the left is, is an actual screenshot from one of our projects using uh, field maps. So you can kind of see what the interface looks like if you haven't already. Uh, very sleek, streamlined, and user-friendly. At this point, you know, we're ready to begin the field data collection. Um, the features or assets that we collect in the field are, are shown here. Uh, you know, I focus this on sanitary, stormwater, and water distribution, but really any assets or data types uh, are, you can collect uh, through field maps if you set it up properly. Um, we collect additional you know, attributes and information such as inlet type, or you know, if, if a storm catch basin has a bicycle safe grate or the eco-friendly sticker on the casting, uh, we're able to collect that, all that is attributes directly through uh, field maps. We use domains in our geo database whenever appropriate, as this allows our field technicians to choose from dropdowns within field maps instead of typing in data. This really speeds up the data collection process and improves the overall quality of data. Um, I might collect something as an RCP uh, acronym and somebody might spell it out. Um, so by having these domains and valid values, you know that you're going to have consistent data that doesn't need to be uh, cleaned up or massaged later. Again, this is uh, one of our GPS technicians from the Raleigh office collecting uh, she actually came up to New Jersey for this project to map a uh, sanitary and stormwater network. Uh, a couple additional photos here of the overall configuration, a couple more screenshots of the actual um, application. So this was for us, the city of Rawway in New Jersey. Uh, it's a large city that uh, they had a legacy mapping of their sanitary and stormwater system, but um, we went through and collected highly accurate uh, mapping of their both systems. ArcGIS trackers used, it used to be a standalone app, but now it's embedded directly within field maps. Um, tracker allows you to see where, users see where they are or have been. It's easy to use and runs in the background, so it doesn't interfere with your data collection. And you're, you know, as I mentioned earlier, your ArcGIS Online or Enterprise GIS Administrator will need to enable Tracker within your GIS. Once it's enabled, the end users are able to turn it on or off uh, location tracking, which is welcome functionality because it allows, you know, having Tracker is welcome functionality because it allows us to track our workers' location for business purposes without infringing on their privacy during breaks, lunch, or while not working. Uh, as we recently added in, uh, you can see in the bottom left here, this tracker duration option, which will automatically shut off tracking. Um, if you were like me, the first times I started using it, I always forgot to turn it off. So when we would go back and look, there would be tracks from our project sites all the way back to my house. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, tracking, location tracking has, has great benefits, but there's also some privacy risk and concerns. Uh, we use it for two main reasons, because we want to know where people have been and where they haven't been. You know, on this uh, project specifically, you know, we were traveling up and down every street within the city just to make sure that, you know, we were collecting all of the surface assets. Um, it helps our field staff plan their day and allow us to confirm we visited each location. And then second, it gives the ability to our field crew to view our field crew's current location and for them as well which is helpful from a health and safety standpoint. And it helps the folks out in the field be efficient because they can quickly locate each other. So if you have a piece of equipment or something that somebody else does, or maybe your battery dies, but you know your colleague has one across town, this helps you see where they are and you can get there quickly. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. Um, Laser rangefinder I mentioned earlier is great because it allows you to accurately collect the location of assets without um, actually having to stand on top of them or occupy them. So if you have a manhole or something in a busy highway or on a um, steep slope, you can actually now use a laser rangefinder to collect that location. On this project, we were dealing with an eight lane highway and I don't want any of my field staff playing Frogger out there in the field. Got to keep everybody safe. Uh, 
I think two more slides here, but I'll go quickly. You know, I mentioned these status dashboards. Uh, so built with ArcGIS dashboard and uh, they allow us to track the real time status in the field. Um, I started collecting GPS data back in 2004 with a backpack unit. And I used to have to plan my field work for certain days and times when I'd have enough satellite coverage to hopefully collect good data. If there was a problem in the field, I could check PDOP and number of satellites, but for the most part, I'd stand there and stare at the old school data logger and looking into the sky, wondering what happened to my satellites. Um, then you had to post-process the data and hopefully import it into your GIS. And this, if you were lucky, happened in a week or two. Um, but now with the new workflow through field maps and external GNSS, as we're collecting data in the field, you can see these, um, these graphs on here, they're dynamic, so they're updating. And uh, one of the benefits of this was it, it caused a, a friendly competition amongst our team to see basically who could collect the most assets. <laughs> so that was a nice benefit. Um, but these dashboards are really sharp and uh, collecting data with field maps allows you to feed the data uh, directly into a uh, dashboard view such as this. Uh, these were the results we had. Again, this is more about field maps than the external uh, receiver, but basically we're able to collect uh, for almost 5,000 assets, 95% uh, within six inches of accuracy in 186 hours. I think that comes down to about two to two and a half minutes per asset. But in reality, you're actually occupying each asset for maybe 10 to 20 seconds, uh, depending on the attributes you want to collect. And whereas most of the time is really um, transitioning and walking between the different assets in the field. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, some, just some key takeaways for the last slide here. Uh, configure, test, and revise before collecting your data. This is important because while you can edit your data model after you begin, it's a best practice to finalize your data model to the best extent possible before moving forward with your full scale data collection. You know, if you have to make changes later, that's just more time processing it in the office. Map it once, I mentioned this um, earlier, you know, if the cost difference between a submeter and a centimeter grade, it, it's, it's small compared to the cost associated with uh, going back and recollecting your data again in two years or five years. The efficiency has gone through the roof. So, you know, with field maps and a GNSS receiver, we're collecting data faster, more consistently and more accurately, which really improves product productivity in the field. Eliminating hazards using technology such as the laser rangefinder is, is always welcomed. You know, we want to keep our people safe out in the field. And then uh, last point, field maps is already an improvement over collector, in our opinion. You know, we're really excited about the next steps for field maps. Um, and, you know, we, we're constantly tracking the roadmap to see what's coming next and when it's gonna be integrated. So with that, I think that's the end of my presentation. Just wanted to thank everyone uh, for joining today. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to send them into the chat or uh, list them here at the end of the uh, symposium and there may be some time to go through those. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, like he said, uh, we, we, we're gonna plow right through here. We're gonna keep plowing right through the, um, the symposium here. Um, if you have questions for Michael, feel free to put them in the chat. I will uh, collect them um, as we go and uh, make sure that Michael gets them uh, if we can't address them at the end of the symposium. Um, so next up is uh, Esri Solutions for Water uh, uh, with Ben Siegel and uh, Lauren Resler. Um, take it away. Yeah, thanks, John. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us at this awesome symposium. Uh, my name is Ben Siegel and I'm a solution engineer with Esri's global water practice team. So I'm more on the technical side of things. So I help our customers navigate the jungle that is Esri technology, help them solve their business challenges with GIS. Um, so yeah, today we're gonna walk through some of the solutions that, off that Esri offers for water organizations. And this is gonna be focused on water, but 
a lot of this applies to other domains. So there are similar solutions for um, different utilities. So for sewer, electric, telecom, um, there's also that stuff available. So yeah, I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna actually stop my video just because I always get distracted. Um, so like I said, today I wanna walk through the different types of data management solutions that are available for water organizations. Um, so with this presentation, I really hope that you'll have an understanding of the differences between the solutions for ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise and, and understand which solution might be best for your organization if you're looking for a data management solution. So I'm gonna start out with the data management for ArcGIS Online solutions, talk about um, uh, what's included with those solutions. I'll do a brief live demonstration. After that, we'll go into the enterprise solutions, which is really the utility network, um, go over some of the capabilities of the utility network, also do a brief demonstration. Um, hey, Ben, I, we're not seeing your screen if you're sharing it out. Oh, uh-oh. Let me try that again. Oh, I see. How about now? Now we can see your presentation screen. There you go. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Um, let me just get organized again. So like I was saying, we'll, we'll start with the data management for ArcGIS Online Solutions. Um, and, and I think if you guys have questions, uh, we're gonna put up our contact information up at the end. So I'd say write down your questions and then feel free to email us, uh, email us if you guys uh, want answers to questions or are looking for a little more information about these solutions. Um, okay, so throughout this presentation, you might hear me refer to the ArcGIS Online Solution as the hosted solutions for water and the ArcGIS Enterprise Solutions as the utility network. And this is because the online solutions take advantage of hosted services within ArcGIS Online, hence hosted, the hosted solutions, and the Enterprise Solutions um, use the utility network as its foundation. So the Enterprise and ArcGIS Online Solutions have a lot of similarities. Uh, both solutions will allow organizations to collect and maintain accurate asset location and information for your water systems. Both solutions also take advantage of WebGIS technology, allowing members of your organization to access your system's data on their desktop, from the web, and on mobile devices. However, there are some key differences to consider when deciding which network management solution is best for you. Um, so the hosted solutions require less resources to deploy and configure than the utility network. These solutions are deployed in the cloud with ArcGIS Online and include these pre-configured layers maps and applications that enable a lot of essential workflows right out of the box. So with very little configuration. Now, on the other hand, the utility network requires ArcGIS Enterprise and is hosted on-premise in your own cloud host or is hosted on-premise or in your own cloud hosting environment. Um, it's important to note that the hosted solutions do not have the built-in network capabilities of the utility network. So this means that you won't be able to set rules on how things connect or run a trace against your system. So if there are specific network functions that your organization wants to take advantage of, then the utility network would probably be the best option for you. Um, so one last difference between the solutions is that the utility network offers multi-user editing and versioning workflows. So when you're working with the utility network, you can use versioning for QAQ, QAQC and management of edits, while this is not an option with the hosted solutions. So with the hosted data management solutions, your organization can get up and running with the system of record that allows you to manage your asset information, utilize desktop editing tools, create these shareable web viewer applications. You can do this all in a short amount of time with pretty little configuration. So currently Esri supports data management solutions for water distribution, sewer and stormwater organizations. So for both ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise, there are solutions for all three of these domains. Now for the ArcGIS Online solutions, um, these solutions include pre-configured layers, web maps and web applications, which, which will allow for, for a variety of those workflows um, tailored to the given domain. So they're configured for um, specific domains um, so let's take a look at 
what's included with these solutions, um, as well as how you interact with these different components. So the hosted solutions are deployed via the web to your ArcGIS Online organization. And like I said, include those data layers, maps, and applications to get you started collecting your asset information. So the solutions are all designed around the hosted feature layers that are referenced throughout the other components. These feature layers store all the asset location and attribute information for your system. Now these layers are then referenced in web maps and applications that can be used in office and field workflows, including for viewing, editing, and collecting information. Now the data from the layers and web maps can be used in web applications and dashboards. So for example, within the hosted sewer data management solution, um, there are dashboards that are configured to view sewer asset information and web applications that are configured for you to edit sewer features within the network. Now the hosted data management solutions also include pre-configured ArcGIS Pro projects that easily allow GIS professionals or data editors to view and edit data from their desktop. So how do you interact with these different components? Well, like I said, the hosted solutions are deployed to your ArcGIS Online organization and include all of these layers, maps, and applications. So when using the hosted solutions in ArcGIS Online, your data is stored as feature layers in the ArcGIS Online cloud. And this allows you, this allows you to access your system data from your desktop where you can perform edits in geoprocessing and pro. On the web, you can edit data, share information, and create content in ArcGIS Online. And then from your mobile device, you're putting data viewing and collection capabilities in the hands of your field workers. So now with that brief overview of the ArcGIS Online solutions, um, let's actually take a look um, at what these solutions look like for water organizations and walk through some of the field and office workflows that they can support. So the, so the first part of the ArcGIS solution that I wanna go over is this basic viewer mapping application. Um, so here we're looking at what's called the water distribution viewer mapping application, which is essentially just an interactive map to view and explore asset information. So um, a big part of these solutions is to help organizations move from paper workflows. So I like to think of this as the digital version of paper maps that a lot of water organizations might currently be using. But with this interactive map, um, we can zoom in, we can move around, we can really explore our system. So maybe I'm interested in the attributes surrounding this feature. So here I clicked on a distribution main and I can see information about the diameter, the material type. I can see when it was installed. Similarly, let's say I click on a fire hydrant. I can also see that similar relevant attribute information. Um, but more specifically, notice how we have this related tables field at the bottom that has hydrant flushing and hydrant inspection records. So let's say I click on the hydrant inspection records. I can see the history of inspections that have occurred on this asset, including the most recent inspection that has occurred. So pretty much any information that you guys have or are collecting about your water systems um, can be accessed through a viewer map like this. Now I can also use this map to search for a location. So maybe I'm interested in assets near 413 Bayberry Lane. When I search the map zooms to that location and I can see all the assets near the address. Similarly, maybe I'm interested in a specific asset so I can use this search widget to search for um, specific assets. So here I'll search for fire hydrant ID 315. And again, map zooms to the location. I see all that relevant information in a pop-up window. So being able to view all this information um, from the web is great, but we also wanna make sure that the same information is accessible to our mobile workers who not only benefit from access to this information in the field, but can also use it um, during inspections. They can use it to share information. So what I'm gonna do is actually pull up my iPad. So here you should be able to see my iPad screen and I'm just mirroring it to my desktop so you guys can see what's happening. But we can see that I have access to the exact same information, the same map. And this is through um, one of our mobile applications called Field Maps. So this is what Michael was talking about um, in the last presentation. Um, so this map is configured mostly just to view asset information, 
but also to share information as well. Um, but as you guys can see, I'm able to move around this map pretty easily. I can click on features to see relevant attribute information. So that might be really important for field workers who need this information um, immediately during inspections or during repairs. I also have the ability to search for location. So as Michael said earlier, field maps um, takes a lot of Esri's core capabilities and combines them into one application. So we just looked at examples of exploring data using um, ArcGIS field maps. However, there are also methods for sharing information and collecting information. So one of those examples is the markup capabilities in field maps. Um, so for example, maybe uh, this hydrant that I'm circling right now needs maintenance. I can make a note of that here. And then I can easily share that information either as a screenshot, I can share it as a feature in ArcGIS Online. Um, and this can just make it really easy to collect information about issues throughout the system and then share that information out. Another workflow for collecting information within field maps is uh, when organizations might wanna report issues with GIS data. So for example, we can see that my location is set right here um, and maybe as I'm inspecting something, I notice that this hydrant here has been mapped incorrectly. Here it's mapped on the north side of the street when I notice that it's actually on the south side of the street. So we'd wanna fix that. Um, we want our hydrants to be mapped as accurately as possible. And we wanna be able to relay that information to the fire department so they know where these features are located. So what I can do is actually add a map change request feature. And like Michael was saying, I can use the built-in GPS on my mobile device I can also connect a high accuracy GNSS receiver to get that sub, sub centimeter, sub meter accuracy. Um, or I can even just move the map to the location of this issue. In this case, I will, I'd say it's a critical map change um, because hydrants are important assets, especially to the fire department. Um, the reported issue in this case is an incorrect location feature. However, notice how we've configured other features to be collected like assets that are abandoned or assets that have incorrect attributes. Um, and this can all be configured even further. So if you guys are looking to collect specific issues um, that aren't included here, then, then you guys can definitely do that using field maps as well. So in this case, it's an incorrect location feature. The asset is a hydrant. I can even add some notes. Hydrant mapped on the wrong side of the street. can also attach a photo with this issue. I would then update the point and submit it. So one of the serious benefits of using the ArcGIS platform and ArcGIS field maps is when you share information and collect information, it's immediately shared across your organization to those who need it. So let's say we go back to this web map and we zoom out. Now we can immediately see that issue that I just reported from the field. And if I click on it, I have that um, important information that was collected. I can see that there's a photo attached. So this ability to share real-time data could be an incredibly powerful tool for organizations who need to um, increase efficiency, who want to be able to communicate effectively. However, with a map like this, there's a lot of features on this map. It might be hard to see updates to data coming in um, with all, all of these features. You know, it, it, it gets a little bit busy. Um, so one way we can organize all this data and see relevant updates to information is through ArcGIS dashboards. So dashboards, like I just said, allow us to see those relevant updates to information while omitting extraneous information. So here we're looking at the map change request dashboard, which um, highlights map issues across my service territory. So using this map, I can see where those issues are located. Here's the same issue I just reported from the field. Um, I can see that same attribute information. I can see if photos attached. I can see the list view of issues over here. Um, I can also filter issues that are critical. Um, here we have issues that include water distribution, sewer and stormwater. So if you guys are managing multiple domains then you guys can essentially combine all that information into one dashboard. Um, so 
I think this is a great example of a dashboard. And from here, a data editor could monitor this dashboard, see these updates coming in, and then use this information to actually edit the authoritative GIS data that's referenced by all those other maps and applications um, that my organization might be using. So next, I wanna take a look at another dashboard that's actually, it's actually a different page within this dashboard called the Hydrant Inspection Dashboard. And this one is specifically configured to monitor the hydrant inspection workflow throughout my service territory. Um, so often we see water organizations are performing annual inspections on their hydrants. Um, so this map in the middle highlights or um, visualizes all the hydrants in my service territory. The hydrants in green indicate that they have already been inspected, while the original symbology indicates that they are still in need of inspection. Um, so let's actually take a look at what a hydrant inspection would look like for a field worker and how this dashboard can get populated. So I'm going to go back to my mobile device. And what we'll do is go, go back to the maps within ArcGIS field maps. So I'm a field user, so I'll go to water field users, open up the hydrant inspection map. Now I'm actually shortening this workflow a little bit, but what you, but what you could do is actually tie in workforce for ArcGIS and a dispatcher could use workforce to assign inspection to a field worker. The field worker would then see that inspection on their mobile device where they could then um, link into field maps and, and essentially open up the field, this exact hydrant inspection map at the location that they need um, and then begin collecting information that way. But here I'm just gonna select a hydrant to be inspected. I can easily open up an inspection form. So in this case, Ben would be the inspector. Today's date, you can fill information like the pressure. So here's one example of the smart form capabilities of ArcGIS field maps. So in this case, I'll say that maintenance is required on this hydrant. And because of that, um, it, field maps uses conditional visibility of fields to then make available these other fields that um, are pertinent to this maintenance information. So I'll say this hydrant requires chains, however, Everything else is in good condition, and I'll make a note of that. Hydrant in good working condition. Now again, I can submit that point, and this information is then immediately shared across my organization. So one way we can see that is if I click off of this hydrant, in just a moment, we'll see the symbology update indicating that it has now been inspected. And let's say we go back to the dashboard within these graphics on the side, I can already see that, oh, this hydrant has been recently inspected today. If I click on it, it'll zoom to that hydrant on the map. And I can also see over here that this hydrant requires chains. So I can see this hydrant that I just inspected requires chains. So this provides essentially a one-stop shop to see the status of the overall inspection process, but also see specifically which assets require maintenance and what maintenance they will require. So these are just a couple of those workflows that the ArcGIS Online Data Management Solutions uh, can be used for. Um, so this hydrant inspection dashboard isn't necessarily included in the solution itself, but it can, the solution can easily be configured to include this type of workflow. Um, so next from here, I actually wanna go back to the slides and take a look at the enterprise solutions. So let's open up this presentation. So like I said earlier, um, the enterprise solutions take advantage of an enterprise deployment as well as the utility network as its foundation. So um, as I'm talking about the enterprise solutions, I'm, I'm mostly gonna refer to them as just the utility network. So I wanna to return to this slide uh, just to go over some of those key differences between the utility network and the hosted solutions. Um, so the key difference between the two data management solutions, as I kind of mentioned, is that the hosted solutions use ArcGIS Online, while the enterprise solutions require an enterprise deployment and take advantage of the utility network as its foundation. But what really sets the enterprise solutions apart are the network capabilities of the utility network. Um, so these capabilities are tracing analysis, rule-based editing, containment and associations, 
as well as some other things that I'll go over throughout this presentation. So the utility network can also integrate with other systems. Um, so the hosted solutions to some extent can integrate with other business systems, but, but for the most part, when it comes to integrating with asset management, customer billing, SCADA systems, um, the utility network is generally the, the better and more practical option. And lastly, um, like we already mentioned, if you require multi-user editing workflows, then um, this is only available to the utility network and not through ArcGIS Online. So I think this slide does a really good job of differentiating the online solutions with enterprise. So um, if you are kind of in the middle and deciding which one to go with, this is a great slide to reference and, and think about. And as you can see, oops, as you, as you can see in this slide, the enterprise solutions essentially have all of the functionality of the online solutions, but have the additional capabilities of those network, um, of those network functions like tracing, rules, containment, um, the benefit of the online solution is that it's easier to deploy and takes a lot less resources to manage. So the utility network was designed to, to meet, um, was designed specifically to meet several of the challenges that modern utilities are facing. So nowadays utilities need to create a digital twin of their system so they can track not just the location of their infrastructure, but also track the operating status and maintenance history of their assets. So this requires a highly detailed and optimized data model and the utility network can provide that. Utilities also need to get data into the field, into the staff that need it most. So they have this up-to-date information so they can make informed decisions during day-to-day -day operations and during emergency situations. Field staff also need to be able to collect information in the field and relay that back to the office so office staff can have a real-time view of operations and the utility network provides this as well. Now the utility network also provides the foundation for integrations with other business systems. And this is due to its services-based architecture. So the utility network can integrate with these other business systems and pull data into GIS to be visualized and analyzed. So when talking about the benefits of the utility network, you can really break the conversation down into these three main topics of more advanced modeling of assets, better visualization and analysis capabilities, and the distributed access of information across your organization. So when it comes to modeling assets in greater detail, um, the utility network's detailed data model and functionality allows um, utilities to model their assets in ways that previously were not possible. So one example is using containers where you can model features within other features, such as the pumps, the valves, and the meters within a pump station. And this can allow you to model your system in greater detail and track those assets, individual life cycle and maintenance history. Now containment also helps keep your, map, your maps looking clean um, with the ability to hide detailed renderings at smaller, uh, view, at, at smaller scales within your maps. And we'll take a look at that within the demonstration. Now, another advanced modeling capability of the utility network is connectivity associations. Uh, so these connectivity associations allow you to connect features to your network without having a physical line connecting them. So for example, this could be useful for connecting valves and meters in an apartment building. We aren't including the pipes between the mains and the individual meters within each unit. So I'm actually gonna skip ahead a little bit because I, I wanna make sure that we get a little bit of the demo in. Um, I'm also gonna cut this demo a little bit short. So like I said, if you guys are interested in seeing more functionality, more capabilities, or just want more information, then please reach out. We'll, we'll make sure to put our contact information within the chat. Um, so this just talks about the uh, better visualization that the utility network offers. Um, so using subnetworks to visualize water loss in more manageable areas. Um, and then lastly, there's the coordinated operations aspect of the utility network, which allows you to access the functionality as well as the data for the utility network from anywhere and from any device. So from the desktop, from the web, and from your mobile device. So similar to the online solution. So 
So like I said earlier, one of the main benefits of the utility network is that it enables integrations with other business systems like customer meter bill or customer billing systems, smart metering systems, SCADA systems. Um, so here we have a dashboard that's configured um, around this map of my water distribution system and it's uh, integrated with smart metering information. So if I actually zoom in on the map, we'll start to see more detail. And if I actually click on a service connection, I can see the most up-to-date water meter reading at this location within the attribute information. Now this dashboard um, also has information about our top residential consumers. So if I move this dashboard around, it'll show the top consumers within this map view, as well as average water usage. Um, similarly, this is focused on our residential consumers, but if I switch tabs, we can also see our top commercial consumers, which sometimes you just have to move the map around to actually find a commercial data point. So now we can see our commercial consumers. Um, now the utility network also provides the ability to summarize total consumption within pressure zones using the built-in functionality of subnetworks, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about later, but just to get a visualization of what subnetworks look like, if I zoom out, we can see that the different subnetworks are visualized using these different colored network lines. And this graphic at the bottom um, allows me to allows me to analyze these subnetworks, and in this case, using um, water consumption within each subnetwork. So all the information that we just looked at is built on top of the utility networks data model. So next, I want to take a look at some of the benefits of the utility networks detailed data model within the ArcGIS Pro. So here in Pro, we're looking at an example of a pump station that's modeled within the utility network. So although you can't see it yet, this pump station is taking advantage of two of the very useful features of the utility network, both containers and associations. So containers allow you to model features within other features. So with, the, so with this pump station, we can see some of the features contained within like the network lines. We can see the pumps features themselves. However, however, if we actually enter containment, we're able to see the pump features like before, but we can also see these valve features. We can see the meter features. We can see the T's connecting the different network lines. Now, one thing that's worth pointing out is these meter features, which are offset from the network lines. And this is because in this pump station, the meters actually sit directly above the valves. So in order to visualize them on the map, we have to offset them a little bit. Now with associations, we're actually able to connect these meters to the valve features without having to add additional pipe just for the sake of modeling. So we turn on the view associations tool. Now we can graphically see those association connections between the meters and the valve features. So next I want to check out some tracing configuration and tracing analysis within ArcGIS Pro. Um, so the utility network, um, you can use the utility network to run tracing analysis, which can be used to provide valuable information um, during planned maintenance and emergency situations. So for example, in this case, let's say I'm an engineer and I'm planning to replace a pipe section that's in poor condition. And we'll say the pipe section is marked by this green dot right here. So as the engineer, I'm gonna to wanna to know what parts of my system will be affected by this maintenance project, um, as well as um, be able to communicate that information to those who need it most. So what I can do with this is I can configure an isolation trace, which, which will help me identify all the parts of my system that will be affected by this planned maintenance. So I wanna run the trace on my water tier at the system or on my water network at the system tier. I want the trace to include the isolated features, so the features that will be affected by this maintenance project. And I want this trace to stop at any valve that is considered operable because those are the valves that I'm gonna to wanna to turn off in order to isolate this area. So as I'm running this, so as this trace tool is running, um, the trace is going out in every direction from that starting green point 
and is identifying those valves that need to be turned in order to isolate the area of this project, and then selecting all the features that are contained within this isolated area. So with these trace results, I now know which valves to turn, I know which hydrants will be affected, and I can notify the fire department. And I also know which customers will be affected and I can let my customer service department um, inform those customers that there might be a temporary outage during this project. So I wanna show one last thing, which is um, running a trace through the web. So what you can do with those trace configurations that we just performed in Pro is publish those, the, um, the trace configuration to your ArcGIS Enterprise where, where it can then be used in web applications. So um, field workers can then use this exact web application and open up the trace widget. They'd put a start location at the location um, where maybe a main break has occurred or they're performing maintenance. So in the case of an emergency situation, within a couple moments, they can immediately determine what valves they'll need to turn off in order to isolate this area, as well as what other parts of the system will be affected. Okay, that was a lot of information. Um, I think we're just getting up on time. Um, so I'm gonna go back to my slides and pull up Lauren and I's contact information. Um, and like I said, yeah, please reach out if you guys have any questions. We're happy to discuss this more, talk about how this might fit in for your water organization. Um, so yeah, please reach out. And I think Lauren's gonna post our contact details in the chat. Thank you, Ben. Um, I, that was really good. Um, again, uh, it, if you have any questions uh, that you wanna ask, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat and uh, I hopefully uh, everyone will stick around to the end and we will have some time for uh, question and answer. But if, if not, then uh, we will collect these questions, send them to the appropriate um, people and hopefully post them on the website so that we can, uh, everybody can see them. Um, we are in the break time of the schedule. So if everybody wants to take the next uh, seven, eight minutes, we'll start again at uh, 2.15 to, um, you guys want to go get a, something to drink or need to visit the facilities, uh, now's your time to do it. Uh, we'll meet back in at 2.15 with um, Shannon and Zach from Charlotte. It helps if I have my microphone on. Um, hopefully everybody's back from getting their drinks. Uh, so let's go ahead and move forward with uh, creating web applications for water and wastewater utility with Esri Enterprise. Um, Shannon Martell and Zach Willard um, from City of Charlotte, take it away. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Um, while Zach is pulling up the presentation, um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. My name is Shannon Martell. I serve as the GIS manager for Charlotte Water. I've been with Charlotte Water for about three and a half years, and I have over 20 years of experience in GIS and local government. And then Zach, while you're getting that presentation up. Uh, hey, yeah, i um, getting that up now. Uh, Zach Ward, I'm a GIS systems administrator um, with the city of Charlotte. Uh, I've been with the city for about five years. All right. So today we're going to, Zach and I are going to discuss um, the web applications that have been created to support Charlotte Water. First, I will give a high level information about the GIS program at Charlotte Water, and then Zach will demo some of the applications that we have. So Charlotte Water is owned and operated by the city of Charlotte. We serve more than a million customers in the city of Charlotte and the surrounding areas. On an average day, we pump about 106 million gallons of drinking water, treat 78 million gallons of wastewater, and we have 8,800 miles of pipe in the water and wastewater systems. All right, so next sec. 
So to support the GIS program at Charlotte Water, we maintain three environments. Um, we do have two enterprise environments. That's basically because um, our cybersecurity team at the city would not approve a web adapter. They didn't like that reverse proxy. So our production Esri environment is internal to the firewall. It is a version of 10.7.1. We do have two ArcGIS server sites. We have a geo event site, image server. We do have utility network. We're in the process of finishing up our conversion from the utility network, or excuse me, from the geometric network to the utility network. And we also have a geoprocessing site. So this is really our workhorse system. This is where most of our users are. We have over a thousand users, most are Charlotte Water, but we do support um, users in other departments across the city that need access to our data. Um, our external enterprise system is a very basic bare bones 10.7.1 environment. And this is mainly for the mobile phone users that are in field operations and customer service. This allows them to see our water and wastewater information on their mobile devices. That way they, we don't have to install NetMotion or some other type of network application onto their cell phones. And then last, we have a small ArcGIS online organization, and that is for our public facing applications that we do. We recently purchased Hub Premium and we've been starting to work on that. So next, so basically when we're building applications, we use the two processes. Um, most of the time we use Esri's Web App Builder. Um, our users are very familiar with it, the interface and you know you kind of get the standardized interface. Um, we do use the geoprocessing services to create custom widgets. Uh, we do that a lot. And then sometimes uh, we end up creating custom JavaScript API applications for the users. Um, so next slide. So these are some of the applications that we're gonna to discuss today. Um, we've got Waterworks, we have a valve isolation trace and sewer trace. Both these applications are based on the geometric network. We have an engineering project editor, a custom JavaScript application called GDAT and another one for the septage program. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Zach. So um, yeah, as Shannon said, we build a lot of applications um, in Web App Builder. Uh, so the first one that I'm gonna go through is our Waterworks application. Uh, this application is sort of the all-purpose um, application for, um, for our end users. Uh, this is sort of a, a desktop uh, replacement. Uh, not everybody needs ArcMap, but everybody needs access. Um, so all of the users in uh, Charlotte Water have access to this application. Uh, it is, uh, we have a lot of the sort of standard um, out of the box widgets. Uh, we have some asset searches that we built, um, uh, parcel searches. Uh, we're pulling in data from the city of Charlotte uh, to kind of make this sort of really a, a one-stop application for our users so that they don't have to bounce. Um, back and forth between applications, uh, print, measurement tool, kind of standard stuff. A couple of the, the custom things that we have uh, with this application are we have a, a street view widget that we share uh, with the city of Charlotte. Um, we have this sitting out, well, <laughs> we have the widget sitting on one of our web app servers um, and we've added that as an item in our portal uh, so that it can be added to any application that's built uh, using uh, using the web app builder. Uh, it's pretty pretty simple. Click in the map, and you get a Google Street View in the in the widget interface. Uh, again, this is just something to kind of keep help our users have everything they might need um, in one location. Uh, another widget that we have that's sort of custom is our our red line. Widget. Uh, this is a again. It's a custom widget. Um, it's a, added as an item in Portal. Uh, the purpose of this is to give uh, field staff the ability to send markup and comments back to the GIS technicians and analysts. Um, it's pretty pretty straightforward to use. There's a draw button. You can make markup on the map. Um, make some comments. Uh, and then you send, hit send. Um, so then an email gets sent to our GIS technicians group um, along with the comments uh, and the username and email address of who 
submitted submitted the request. Um, and there's also a screenshot included of the markup that they made in, in the web application. Uh, this is used pretty heavily. Um, this was used, it's used pretty heavily by our field staff and our technicians to make sure that our data is staying, uh, staying accurate and current. A couple of applications that we have to um, assist our end users with um, doing some basic uh, tracing on the network. Uh, we have a valve isolation application um, that we built in Web App Builder. The, the widget itself we downloaded from the Esri solution site. Um, and again, it's one that we have out on, on the app server and added it as an item into portal. Um, it's built, again, as Shannon said, on the geometric network. We are moving to the utility network. So um, eventually a lot of this application will be migrated to the utility network. Um, but it's it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Again, uh, you can select a pipe on the map. Uh, you hit run. And then there's a geoprocessing service uh, that's running the trace, and then we'll you know, we'll send the results back to the map. Um, so what we get on the map is a general general buffer of the affected area. Um, it highlights the pipes. It highlights affected service lines. Uh, it also highlights uh, valve locations. These are the valves that can potentially be turned to isolate uh, that section of pipe. Uh, this application gets used pretty regularly, um, not, not regularly, but in our EOC, uh, in the event of a main break, uh, this application can be pulled up. Uh, and what it does is for us is it saves time and in that it gives the EOC staff or field staff the ability to run this trace themselves rather than having to contact a, a GS analyst or technician, have them open pro or, or have them open arc map run the trace and create a map. Um, it, it puts that functionality in their hands and helps them to, to do their job a little more efficiently. Uh, similar application to that is our, we have an upstream an upstream trace application for our, for our sewer line. Uh, this application is was built to replace an older uh, flex application that needed to be decommissioned. Um, the flex application, there was a widget in the flex application that that did this tracing, um, but it was supported by a server object extension uh, that lived that was added to Arc Server at that time. Now we worked with Esri to 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 move that functionality to a uh, a new widget um, and a geoprocessing service. So this application uh, is supported by a geoprocessing service. Uh, again, it's you can you come into the map. You uh, it, there's some different options for this widget versus the valve isolation widget. Uh, there's an uh, there's a limit to the trace um, that's built in to keep people from uh, basically running a trace on the entire network, um, just this sort of a, a little control step there. Uh, there's a buffer trace option. Uh, so what the what the tool does is when you when you run the trace, um, it it buffers any of the affected pipes by that trace amount, uh, selects the adjacent parcels and then selects the address points that are in those parcels uh, and generates a a CSV file that can be downloaded um, so that homeowners can be contacted. Uh, this one's used by our lab primarily to, to sort of research contamination issues. If they find something in a, a manhole that shouldn't be there, they can run this trace to see what's upstream of the pipe um, and they find out what's there and who may need to be contacted. So I'm going to let that run and 
I'll come back and show you the CSV in a minute. Um, another application that we built, not necessarily for analysis, but to sort of uh, streamline uh, some of our workflows is our engineering project editor application. Uh, we built this application for our project managers and and engineering staff to be able to maintain their own project boundaries. Uh, the workflow prior to this had been that they would uh, create maybe a PDF map or send an email with some general text about, hey, we've got a project on this street, we need a polygon, um, and that would go to the GIS technicians to maintain. But that was that was the workflow for a while, but with the abilities that, that come with the enterprise site, we were able to build this application for the for our end users. Um, it's, it's really simple to use. Um, we've done multiple trainings with the users and, and they're really picking it up now and using it. Uh, we have a, a basic edit widget that can be used to just draw to draw a project boundary on the map, you can update the project number and the project type. Uh, but based on some feedback, uh, we, we added some geoprocessing widgets to um, simplify the workflow a little bit. So there's a geoprocessing service uh, that supports this application that essentially uh, takes an input, buffers it, uh, updates the attributes based on the input from the widget um, and then loads that into the project layer. So one widget allows the end user to select a water main or sewer main or street or stream, whatever the area that they're working in. Um, they update the project number and click run and that buffers that street. Um, using the same service, we configured a, a second geoprocessing widget uh, that allows them to to upload a shape file. Uh, so if, if they've got a, if they have ArcMap or they have something that they've exported out of CAD, uh, a section of street or pipe or some other area, they can zip that up, uh, zip that shape file up, uh, upload it to the widget and um, perform the same, the same processing on it as you would by selecting it on the map. So bounce back here. Okay, I'm just coming back here to the upstream trace application. So the trace is finished running and it's selected all of the addresses that are adjacent to the trace location. Uh, this list can be exported as a CSV file uh, and then used by staff to, to do further research. So those are, those are some of the, the apps that we um, built using the Web App Builder and configured uh, for our users. Um, we do have a, some applications where um, our end users have had requirements that can't necessarily be covered um, by the out of the box functionality. Um, one of those is we had a request from our customer service staff uh, to replace a, basically they had a Google Earth application that they that lived on their desktops uh, that was maintained um, by running a Python script to, to do some data manipulation and create KML, KML files that they could use in uh, Google Earth. Uh, so we basically, using the JavaScript API, we were able to construct, uh, build a sort of a custom application that, that gave them all the functionality that they requested. They wanted they wanted to be able to click a button and hide the map or show the map. Uh, they wanted to be able to select multiple filter options. There, there was just functionality that, that they had requests for that was better. We were better able to meet that need using uh, the API. Um, this application uh, has gone through several iterations. We built it in Web App Builder, we built it in Dashboard. Uh, and again, we, we finally landed on 
we're going to need to build this sort of a custom piece uh, to help them out. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk about uh, this application that we built for our um, for permit management, septage, septage, septage permit management. Um, there was a, a request to replace or help replace an older .NET application. Um, so we started out by building uh, survey one, two, three forms to, to capture um, truck information for basically um, trucks that pump out septic tanks or porta potties where they're unloading at Charlotte Water Facilities, those trucks are tracked. Um, and in the older system, uh, so we started. We started out by moving to Survey One Two Three forms, um, which is great. Uh, it's it's a super easy way for the end users to capture the information. Uh, but then there was a request uh, to to actually manage that information and update that information. Um, so we we built web maps. We built various a, a few different mapping applications for them. But those but those end users weren't really um, necessarily, they didn't need a map was the feedback that we kind of got. They, they really wanted, they really wanted to just be able to search for a, a company and kind of just update the data. So using the, again, using the Esri API, um, we were able to build this application for them. Uh, so all of the data that supports this application uh, lives in our enterprise. So the data that they're updating is the data that's submitted via these surveys um, at the top. So this, and we have some notifications built on the back end uh, when this data is updated, everybody that needs to get notified receives an email. Um, but again, it was, the functionality was there and the capabilities were there to build this application for them. Uh, pretty much using just the enterprise system and um, by using the code, using custom code that we were able to write using the Esri API. So I think that is everything I wanted to cover uh, in the demo. So I'm gonna pass it back to Shannon to um, wrap us up. All right. Thanks, Zach. So um, some of the outcomes of these web applications, it did uh, lower our reliance on the desktop software. Uh, we do have, we typically had a lot of desktop users in uh, Charlotte Water alone. We had 135 desktop licenses that were out for ArcMap. Um, with COVID and everybody working from home, that did not work well over the VPN. So we found that we had a huge demand for web applications so that people could shift their workload from using the desktop software to web software. So we've got some other web applications that we've created for specific things like um, mapping sewer spills, or um, we've got some uh, outfall clearing projects, that kind of thing. Um, with being able to create custom widgets and tools, we were able to take complex processes and complete them with a widget. Um, which was very handy. And then that data creation and editing could be completed by someone outside of the GIS group. So we weren't relying on emails or somebody dropping a piece of paper by, drawing some, where a project was. You know, they could enter, enter in their own project boundary. They could go back and change it if they need to. And then this allowed us to streamline some data with some other integrations. So like um, with the projects where people were able to draw in their project boundary, then we have a process to go pull data out of eBuilder and then we can put the combine the data together and we can push this up to a city dashboard and we also have it in our own web map. So um, it's really opened some things up for us. Um, if you can go to the next slide for me, Zach. And then to kind of help with these applications, we do have some additional tools. We do use FME for a lot of our data, uh, shuffling data around because we grab data from CityWorks, Banner, eBuilder. There's also data, other data that sits in the data warehouse. We do use GeoJob's admin tools for portal. Um, it, that has been very helpful, especially the notification function because you can pull out all your users and create an email list. You know, because that's one thing that 
can't really do with portal, you know, from out of the box. So sometimes when we have a, an outage for whatever reason, we can send out an email. And then we also use uh, Clean, Clean My Org by GeoJob just to kind of see what services that have been created. Because we do have publishers in our organization that, are, that can create their own dashboards or maps. We can kind of just go in and see who's created a service that isn't being used and is locked down to one person and just kind of ask, do you still need this? Are you still using it? If not, you know, could you remove it? That kind of thing. Um, so, and I think that's it for us. This is Zach and I's contact information. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either one of us. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you guys. That was uh, very informative. Um, we do have uh, a few minutes for questions um, for Zach and um, I'm drawing a blank at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon. <laughs> Shannon. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, I'm not actually seeing anything just yet. All right. Um, well, for the sake of uh, time, let's just go ahead and keep moving then. Um, if you guys have questions that come up, um, feel free to throw them into the, um, the chat here on the red line tool. How did you integrate with email? I guess this is to Shannon and Zach. This is from you, Kevin I'll Borman. Let, okay, great. Can everybody hear me? Um, yeah, so the widget is um, it's JavaScript. It's a JavaScript widget. Uh, so in the JavaScript code itself, um, there's a function to call uh, and, and send an email. So when you click submit, the function fires to, to send an email and, and pulls the information um, from the widget uh, interface. Uh, the email itself, the email address itself, we're grabbing from the portal login. Uh, there was an older version of this tool that grabbed the email address from the logged in Windows user account, uh, but that functionality uh, did not work with uh, Google Chrome. So we had to make some adjustments to uh, it only work with Internet Explorer, basically. Um, so that's, that's how it's doing that. Okay, thank you, uh, Kevin says. Um, all right, if uh, the Andrew and Lee are ready, but let's go ahead and start with them. Uh, they're doing ArcGIS indoors for facility management. Share the screen here. This is the right one. All right, so can everyone see the screen now? Yes. All right, well, uh, hello everyone. Hope you're enjoying the symposium. Uh, we've seen some really interesting uh, presentations so far and we're really excited to, little, to share a little bit about what we're doing in Raleigh Water uh, around leveraging ArcGIS indoors for So what you're seeing here is some drone footage from our Noose River Resource Recovery Facility. And hopefully this will provide some context as far as the type of facilities we're trying to manage uh, with ArcGIS indoors. While this is playing, I'll give a brief introduction. My name is Andrew Hayes. I'm a technology supervisor for Raleigh Water. And I'm joined here today with Lee Kimmel, who is a technology analyst with Raleigh Water. <clears throat> So how do we get in indoors? Uh, Raleigh Water identified the need to implement a vertical asset management plan. And a major component of that plan was to implement uh, CityWorks. 
SeaWorks is the city of Raleigh's asset management and work management application. <clears throat> so we had implemented SeaWorks for our linear systems. So our water distribution and sewer uh, collection system back in 2017. And uh, we wanted to roll that forward with the vertical treatment plants or uh, through the treatment facilities, sorry. So if you're not familiar with CityWorks, it's a GIS centric application. Essentially what that means is that <clears throat> it sits on top of our GIS inventory and it consumes the GIS data. So in our linear system, that looks like assigning uh, work activities to a manhole or a fire hydrant. So this is where we identified our first challenge. We didn't actually have an inventory of assets at the treatment facilities. In fact, there wasn't an asset inventory anywhere. It didn't just ex not exist in GIS. We didn't have spreadsheets or anything. So typically, if we were going to build out a vertical asset system like this, we would have generated a series of related tables that were related back to a building space, uh, typically a, a building footprint. footprint. However, uh, the department had a desire to replicate the end user experience, uh, whether the user was using a, a City works for our linear system or in our vertical system. So that basically translates to they wanted to be able to see the asset as a point in the map. So this created a second challenge. Uh, in order to show these assets in the correct spatial location, we needed to have a way to show the inside of buildings. So we started looking at um, different solutions that would allow us to map out interior spaces. And early on, we identified ArcGIS indoors as a potential solution. And although ArcGIS indoors offers a lot of uh, functionality, there's a lot of use cases that it can be used for, we really focused in on the asset management or asset maintenance component of it. However, at the time, ArcGIS Indoors was a very new solution. Uh, we're talking about looking at this back in 2018. And so before we wanted to move forward and make a recommendation that we would use ArcGIS Indoors as a uh, facility management solution, we really wanted to be able to test it out um, and see how well it was gonna actually use work for our purposes. So we wanted to build, build out a prototype and uh, Again, the, the purpose of that prototype was to see how usable the output was. Uh, we'd seen a lot of presentations before that showcased 3D interior spaces, but the reality of actually using them, it, it didn't always match up. Uh, whether there was lag in the rendering of the images, uh, you can only access the 3D images in certain software that might not be available for staff. And then, there was a high cost in actually producing the 3D environment. So we asked Lee to build out a indoor space for us. And this was the first uh, prototype that we built. This is one of our pump stations. Um, and you can see it's a very 3D representation of the interior space. Uh, we actually have a web scene that we'll share at the end um, that you guys can access and kind of navigate around. It's a, it's a pretty neat thing. And even in this web scene, uh, all of these assets you see are actual assets in GIS. So you could select the pumps or the motors, you can select the stairwell, the lighting, the roof, they're all available as assets to select. So again, this is a very detailed uh, image, but we overbuilt it on purpose. Uh, one, we wanted to make sure we knew what the capacity of the technology was and what the capacity of our staff were to develop something of this uh, level of detail. And we also wanted to be able to show our management team and the project team where we felt like the technology was heading. However, we don't want uh, people to think that you have to have this level of detail in order to benefit from indoors. And in fact, we didn't have indoors when we built this. 
So this image here is uh, more of a representation of what the indoor tools will actually produce as an output. But you can see here, there's a lot of detail. Um, you can see the rooms, you can see the windows, the doors, the exit and entrance ways to each uh, office space. So although it might not be as detailed as that prior uh, 3D model, the interior spaces is still well-defined. And here's that same uh, site now in a 2D viewer. But again, it contains all of the interior details that you'd want. Um, and this is actually a view of the indoor application. And if you're not familiar with indoors, uh, just to highlight some of the functionality, on the left-hand side, you can see there, there's a routing component. So you can route from a uh, one room to another uh, office space. Uh, you can actually route from one facility to another facility, and you can go from one campus to another campus. On the right-hand side, you'll see that there's attribution about that space. So it's not just a visual, there's actual attribution behind these assets. And then the top right corner, you'll see the, uh, where it says laboratory, it's basically a facility picker. So it makes it really easy to navigate from one building to another. And then underneath that, you have the, uh, the level or the floor picker. So if you wanted to filter out to only see one layer or one level of the building, you can easily do that with the floor picker tool. So I'm gonna turn it over to Lee to talk through a little bit how we actually built the indoor environment. All right, hopefully you can hear me. <clears throat> um, all right, so I should have hopefully control over this. Let me try. Coming back, okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, so um, as Andrew was talking about, we wanted to um, take our campuses from their uh, water treatment, wastewater treatment plants and convert them over to indoor spaces. Uh, part of the issue with that was um, accessing data that we could convert over to GIS. So uh, utilizing the ArcGIS indoor solution, um, you're capable of inputting your facility data into the software or into GIS with multiple source types. Um, and you can do that with Revit files or CAD files. Um, and you know, one of the issues with that we came across with is you know, some of our facilities are quite old and uh, didn't necessarily have digital files available for them. So sometimes you can have uh, paper files laying around and develop flat uh, PDF images from this. Um, and then again, if you don't even have those, other options you're capable of inputting this data with are uh, digitizing, um, you know, contracting that out, uh, scanning the building is another option, like um, getting a 3D Revit scan and converting that over to floor plans. Um, but we started off with the um, CAD file approach. And, you know, so looking through the CAD files, we had a mishmash of available uh, data. And uh, we had to clean those CAD files up to get them to go through the indoor tool process. So, um, if, you're, if you have CAD for like electrical drawings or you have like an overview site of your CAD, you can utilize either one of those, but you have to clean them up and get them to match the um, indoors tool um, capabilities. And then you have to fill out a spreadsheet that has metadata information for your uh, facility, like the name, the address, and its height information. Um, so once you get that data cleaned up, you can process it through the indoors tool set and you'll get a um, output like we saw on the previous slide. And you'll get a, um, the data has a Z value associated with it and also multi-patch features that um, can be utilized in 3D web scenes. Um, let's see if I can get this slide to get some text. Um, so the tool set and RTS indoors, um, you, when you get the indoors tool set, you have to have the in, uh, Esri indoors solution, which is basically its own portal site that gives you access to all the uh, indoor solutions, including the toolbox. Um, so the first approach would be creating an indoors database. So this is taking a file geo database and um, setting it up to create the indoors, RGS indoors information model. Um, it creates all the blank empty feature classes and uh, base networks and all that um, information. The next thing you do is um, you import, I actually have these kind of backwards, sorry. You would import your, um, I'm gonna go ahead and go through all these. You would import your floor plans to the indoors geo database that you just created. And after that is done, um, you would then run the 
the data through the networking tool set, and it'll generate a, kind of a mesh of your floor space. And when that is generated, um, you have to go in and do a couple more um, fine tunings of if, uh, if you have multiple levels, for instance. Um, as you can see this image over here, we have uh, floor transitions and stuff. These are not automatically generated, so you have to create those uh, for your routing information to know how to transfer between levels. So um, once you have those generated, um, you basically will create a network um, an analyst uh, that you publish up to your portal. And that will be kind of the, the routing solution that your um, indoors application will utilize. Um, one thing I wanted to note too, is if you're using CAD files to create your indoors data set, you need a georeference though sometimes, unless they are already georeferenced. Geo so that can be kind of an issue if you're trying to get with like, uh, you know, survey grade scale levels of your building, hopefully your CAD files come georeferenced. So that way they'll pop into GIS just how they should be. Otherwise you can utilize um, uh, building footprints to kind of link up your, your CAD files with. And one last thing I want to say is if you had a flat file PDF, one of the alternatives you can do is uh, just trace the lines that you need to bring in to indoors uh, to get this, the software to import the, the data. So you're, you don't necessarily have to have perfect information to bring it into the indoors tool set, um, but it's, it's helpful to have that up front. Um, the ArcGIS indoors information model uh, consists of several uh, attributes that are, or sorry, uh, feature classes that are important. Um, one of the outputs would be your site. So this is basically your campus or the area of all your buildings of interest. Um, and for us, this is one of our wastewater treatment plants. So this is the whole entire area uh, that we would call the site. So this is our Noose River Resource Recovery Facility. Um, and up here is where the majority of our structures are. Um, the next level would be your um, facility. And this is uh, just basically like a building footprint that you would have, but this is also generated from your CAD file. So you don't have to worry about using building footprints if you don't have them. Um, so this is our one of our administration buildings and a laboratory building that we have out there. Um, and then the next step up from that would be your uh, building levels or your floors. So this will distinguish between um, your basement, first floor, second floor, et cetera. And then finally, the um, last level would be your um, units or rooms. So these are all the individualized unit spaces um, that are throughout your facilities. And um, within that, you can see there's like details that are imported into the GIS. So we have like the door openings and the um, glass and all, all that stuff's available if you wanted to render that in 3D and web scene as well. Um, so those are the main feature classes uh, of the buildings in ArcGIS indoors. Um, let's see if we can move on. So one of the other outputs that we get are places of interest. So these are things that would kind of typically come into um, your indoor solution. So actually, I want to point out indoors was originally developed for um, things that you would see a lot of public going through, like malls or airports train stations, et cetera, stuff like that. Um, so a lot of the built-in indoors information or like um, for points of interest would be uh, like kiosks. Um, you would have vending machines, uh, water fountains, stuff like that. So for us, uh, we're, we're interested in that level as well, but um, I will expand on that in a little bit, but just to let you know, so here's the, um, points of interest that are kind of default, we'll end up with uh, safety and security. So these would be your exits, your entrances, your fire extinguishers, um, any other like fire alarms, stuff that you wanted to map out that way. And this stuff can get mapped from your CAD information automatically. Um, places and things are another type of points of interest. So uh, for us right here, these would be your um, kind of centroids of your rooms. This is utilized in routing and um, as well as like room bookings and stuff like that. So if, if you're using the mobile app, you can click on these places and things to get more information or um, it's, it's also utilized in the um, part of indoors. There's this, uh, the, my mind's going blank, sorry. Uh, you have the indoor routing, but you also have the wayfinding. So the points of interest, places and things, safety and security kind of integrate with that wayfinding as well. So 
that helps you navigate to those um, spots. So like I said before, we have uh, retail and services. These would be like your shops and kiosks and then um, food and beverage as well. So those are the kind of typical things that you'd see with the indoors import um, for places or yeah, places of interest. But for us, like I said, we are kind of interested in doing our vertical assets as well. So this is a picture of one of our uh, actuator um, for a gate valve that we have. And as you can see, we kind of tagged it with an asset tag with the facility ID, but we want these to be points of interest in our map. So what we did was we went in and adjusted the configuration file for indoors to include some of our data. And um, we, or when I say some of our data, we mapped out our vertical assets that we were going to be uh, collecting and we integrated that into the indoors environment. So example of some of those would be pumps. And as you can see, they show up on the indoors map right here. Um, we also have screens and uh, valves. So these are a few examples. Um, another thing you can integrate into this is CityWorks work orders. If you're utilizing CityWorks, so um, you can see points here for your work orders and you can label them obviously to show the details that you're interested in. So adding these in as places of interest, the endorse tool set allows you to net, like uh, navigate to those assets. So if you're in another room at, a, at another building, you can enter the facility ID of that asset that you have in there and it will route you to that asset. And it will also show you if you click on in the indoors application, if you click on the room, it will show you what assets are related to that room spatially. And if the assets are moved around by uh, field staff editing, those assets will automatically get updated as um, they're moved, which is a nice feature. Um, part of the data design um, that we were looking at for our vertical assets, um, we have location, uh, system of process, the um, database and asset information. So all these are very important for the data design and integrating that into the ArcGIS indoors information model. So we generated roughly 16 feature classes for our wastewater uh, treatment plant, valves, pumps, um, screens, uh, generators, et cetera. So we included the ArcGIS indoors information model data with that, as well as some of our PLC information. So this will be useful for our um, system operators as well as the GIS slash database relevant information. So our facility IDs and uh, editor tracking and active status. Um, and then we wanted to include obviously the information for our operators and mechanics. So the asset information itself. Um, so we generated all that, integrated it to uh, the configuration files for ArcGIS indoors and published that up to our portal and um, added that into a ArcGIS field maps application. So after that, uh, we initially, for our wastewater treatment plant, we collected all that through um, kind of tabular form, as Andrew said before, but our current, we're doing our water treatment plant now, and we're utilizing field maps from the beginning to collect this data. So um, as you can see, you can um, import that map into field maps. And um, it, it's really useful because field maps gives you the ability to filter through the room. So if, if you're in field maps, you'll have an option to click on first floor or second floor, and they'll filter all that information out. And you're able to add in, as you can see in this bottom picture, if we wanted to add an actuator operator, um, we could click on the one that we would like, and we would get uh, the plus sign kind of roughly where we're standing. Uh, again, it's not like survey grade, uh, just based off of the GPS that's available, because you're inside a structure. So whether you're using um, Wi-Fi or you kind of have a rough GIS or sorry, a GPS point, you can selectively move this asset or this um, plus sign to where you want it to be roughly and then add the asset. Um, so it's, it's really useful that way. So if you're like on the second floor, you filter down to the second floor, um, you're able to add that information there. Let me see if I can get the next one. I had a quick video of that. I feel like I'm kind of running out of time, but I, I feel like we were a little bit behind anyway. So I, forgive me for that. Um, just really quick, I just wanted to play this. So this is just kind of an example of using field maps. Um, this is a console that we were trying to collect. Um, we're clicking through here. We have the asset tag and we're able to find um, the room that it's located in. We get the information and uh, we can add the asset. So I think hopefully I'm able to do that here. So trying to locate the asset. Let's see if I can speed this up a little bit. 
don't want to take up too much time. I'm sorry. Um, let's see if I can find the spot here. I think I actually just rewound it. Well, so once you add the point, you'll get the asset information to so you can type it in. And the nice thing about field maps is we included barcodes on our um, asset tags that you can scan in with uh, field maps. So the facility ID will automatically get inputted. And then field maps will take the unit ID of the room and auto populate that. Um, oh, thank you, John. Um, so with that information, inside field maps. Actually, let me, I, can, I think it paused. Um, so with that inf information side of field maps, um, it'll be input in GIS and your mechanics, your operators will automatically be able to see it once it's added in. And um, we, part of this project obviously was to integrate this stuff to CityWorks. So this will give the mechanics the ability to edit attribute information on the assets as well as um, see that asset information inside of CityWorks to create work orders or inspections off of. Um, so just a, just a quick demo of what it would look like in field maps. And here's, here we are kind of out in the field collecting some of the information. So move on to the next one. So inside CityWorks, um, there's an integration between RTS indoors and CityWorks. Um, and they're constantly improving this. Um, but right now uh, they've, they've integrated kind of the floor picker as well as a uh, ability to pop up asset information inside of in, uh, indoors to CityWorks. So this is an example of um, what indoors would look like. If I select the, the structure, um, I will be able to click on this room, like a 100 screening area, and I'll get a pop-up to the side. Um, and then inside that pop-up, I'll have information linking me to CityWorks asset viewer. So within this pop-up, I'll have um, the attribute information um, which I have over here as well, but this right here inside of CityWorks is editable, which is a plus for operators. Um, I actually want to point that out too. Inside, currently inside the indoors application, the data is not editable in this application. So if people need to edit here, they either need to use field maps or the editing capabilities within CityWorks. So this pop-up gives them the ability to do that as well as view the work order history of said uh, room or asset. So um, if they did a for this particular room, if they did a, a work order against flooring or a, you know, repainting the walls, they would be able to see all that history inside the work orders uh, history tab. Um, and then obviously we can go to CityWorks itself and see the RTS indoors information inside of CityWorks. So this is a CityWorks map. If you're not familiar with CityWorks, this is what that map will look like. And um, the indoors, um, integration adds a floor switcher to CityWorks, which, allow, which allows you to switch between levels so you can filter out and view your assets. Um, and obviously through here, you can click on an asset and um, have that selected and create a work order. And another thing is you can go through CityWorks and obviously just like any other your assets, all your horizontal assets, you can see all of your vertical assets and their work orders. So you can do GIS asset searches or you can look up all your work orders as you would normally for all your uh, horizontal assets. So um, if I had my uh, structure maintenance inspections or work orders in here, I'd be able to see those and view all the information and do reporting off of them. Um, so I think that's basically it. So Andrew, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Uh, so again, hopefully uh, the presentation was helpful. Uh, you know, I think I just want to make sure we acknowledge that there's a lot of people involved with this project beyond just Lee and myself. We had a lot of support from the project team, especially around the database design and the data collection effort, um, as well as from our IT CityWorks and IT GIS teams. And we actually had a lot of help from Esri and CityWorks that were providing guidance and support along the way. Uh, again, we hope that this uh, will encourage some of you guys go out there and explore the potential ways indoors can help your organization. And we want to reiterate that you don't have to have perfect data to build out this. It's great if you do, but we know that most people probably don't have uh, high resolution 3D uh, Revit files for all of our facilities. Uh, so I, I hope again, this is uh, an opportunity to kind of show what indoors can be as far as the vertical assets, 
as Lee kind of pointed out there within CityWorks, they function the same way as any other asset you have in your GIS inventory. Uh, so there's no real secret to how this works. It's just a cool tool to allow you to map out your interior spaces. And again, if anyone has any questions, uh, please contact me or Lee. We're very happy to kind of talk through the project. Uh, if you have specific questions, we're more than happy to answer them. Or uh, if you want to set up a, another meeting to kind of go into a detailed overview of the project, again, we're, we're happy to do it. Uh, on the screen here, you can see some URLs that we have for the web scene. And then uh, Lee actually created a 360 VR scene as well. Uh, that's really cool. We'll actually show some of that here. So if you want to check those out, uh, we encourage you to do so. So that, that's it for us. If you have any questions, we're uh, more than happy to answer. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Lee. That was very informative. I really enjoyed that. Um, we do have a question. Um, uh from beth who wants to know whether or not um you know, this is part of your your license agreement or are you buying this separate from um your ela so we actually added this on um as a separate order uh two years ago when we implemented it, or a year and a half ago um but we're, we're getting uh city of raleigh is actually moving forward with a new ea agreement starting in the end of this year, December of this year, and we will have it included in our EA agreement. Okay. Um, I can you post a uh, senior your URL in the chat. Um, this is Ben to everyone. Um, yes, we will try to. I can't see the chat on my screen, so leave. Can you right. throw yeah, those I'll in there? You. Yeah, I'll try to get that right now. Um, and what is the most uh, what was the most challenging aspect that you faced in this process? Uh, Andrew, do you want to take that, or do you want me to take that? <laughs> well, I, I think just from my personal standpoint, we had a lot of uh, initial conversations early on, uh, based on where we felt the technology was with indoors. And we had a lot of debate of what we could do outside of it and was the value there. And, you know, in some ways we thought we could produce something that would be more functional uh, ourselves, right? And so there was a lot of debate back and forth between me and Lee and the project team um, about the value added. And a big piece for us was that this is a brand new platform at the time or a brand new solution. And so it, it took a, a lot of debate about you know, is it worth jumping in early? Because, you know, we could probably outproduce something now, but then we're going to have to maintain this custom system. And what we really wanted to do was get involved with indoors early on. And so we're now benefiting from all the enhancements that Esri is making to the indoor uh, solution. And so, you know, again, that was kind of the decision point of, hey, are we going to invest in indoors or are we going to try to do something separately? And I think we made the right decision of jumping into indoors early because uh, now like said, we're structured in a way that we can leverage the emerging technology that Esri produces around the indoor space. Great. Are, uh, any more questions I, in the chat? Um, if not, we'll open it up for questions for all the, the presenters. Um, yeah, I have another question for for Al. Sure, go ahead. Super impressive work, honestly. I, I, I'm on the water team, and and we're talking about indoors as as a use for facility management for treatment plants. Exactly how you guys have done it. So it's really cool to see you guys have done that. Um, curious, have, have you guys thought about bringing in the utility network and 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 making those two systems communicate at all? Yeah, so that's definitely another consideration we have with why we wanted to go to uh, or stick within the Esri platform for our facility management. We haven't transitioned over to the utility network yet, but that is in our kind of business plan for the next year, year and a half to start that migration. Uh, so we're definitely interested to see how those two systems play together. Now, I don't know if you saw in some of the images or even the drone footage, when we're talking about these vertical assets, you know, even the, the picture that Lee had up in the CityWorks example, that asset was sitting outside. 
And so there is a linear component to the systems and the processes. So that's where we think utility network, uh, in, including that with the indoor uh, solution will add a lot of value to us. Anybody else? Uh, now's your chance to ask. And this can be for uh, any of the presenters today. I'll go one more time. <laughs> for, <laughs> sure. I thought that presentation was so cool. Um, I'm curious. So you guys talked about using indoors for navigating to like different points of interest and stuff like that. Are you, are you guys doing any navigation in 3D or is it all in 2D web applications? Uh, the navigation, well, well, that, that's a that's a quite a statement actually. So for the RTS indoors application, navigation um, works in 3D, which they have available in that application. Um, so you can you can switch between 2D and 3D in that view. But as far as like field maps right now, obviously navigation doesn't. The 3D is not going to work to there. So um, we we will have the ability to to navigate 3D. In, in the in the application itself but as far as like editing data and stuff that kind of right now induces some limitations so um kind of more of a showpiece at this point in time that makes sense cool thank you mm -hmm. well nancy uh, I'm not hearing any further questions. Uh, do you want to take us out? Absolutely. Uh, first, again, I want to thank all of our speakers. There were some really fantastic presentations today, and I hope everyone had something that they could take from it. Um, and I also wanted to thank the audience, too, for uh, being here and participating and making this a, another successful symposium. Um, our next event is our conference. And as Joseph said at the beginning, it's August 31st through September 2nd, but we will be trying to have some pre-conference workshops on Monday, September 30th. Um, because it's virtual, it's just a $25 registration, which goes for your membership next year. So it's the bargain of the year. It's great. Um, we already have, I think, 16 or 17 sponsors, but we are accept accepting additional sponsors. The sponsorships are just $100 or $200. So if you want your company to have a presence um, in the virtual uh, sponsor hall, please contact us through the website. Um, Rick Wallace is handling that. Um, and last but not least, we do need speakers. We have several people that have submitted request uh, proposals. But um, if you are interested in earning some GIS people, points or you have a project that you would like to share, we would love to hear from you. So please go to our website, go to the conference page. And on that conference page, you can register, you can sponsor, and you can submit your proposal to speak. Um, one final thing, we're hoping to be able to have our first in-person event in October. Uh, if it all works out, we're hoping to have our government symposium back in Hickory in late October. Um, we're still working on the date for that. So hopefully we'll be able to see each other face to face and uh, be able to catch up after this very long COVID quarantine. So thank you again, our speakers and the audience, and hope to see you all again for our conference. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, everyone.